So the topic of this video is turbine, specifically steam turbine, and how do we calculate the expansion curve and turbine thermal power. So first of all, whenever we are calculating the turbine, we can safely assume that the heat losses are going to be negligible. So turbine is always very well thermally insulated and the steam is flowing through it at a very high rate of speed. So that means that there's very little time available for any heat losses to take place. So no heat losses. <clears throat> Typically the situation is that we know what is the state of the steam coming in. So typically we would know the enthalpy or maybe we don't know the enthalpy, but we at least know the temperature and the pressure, which are the most easily measurable state variables of the steam going to the turbine. And we remember from the first lecture, the Gibbs phase law that uh, if we know two state variables of a pure substance in single phase, then that means that the state is completely fixed. And from pressure and temperature, which we typically know, we can determine what is the enthalpy. Typically, we would also know what is the expansion efficiency of the turbine. And then we have to figure out what is actually the end state where we end up after the expansion in the turbine. And in solving that, basically we apply the definition of the isentropic efficiency. So basically the definition of the efficiency, we can look at it as, uh, well, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, that uh, it means that H1 minus H2, that is the enthalpy difference. That is how much in kilojoules per kilogram we get energy from steam into the turbine rotor. And what is here, the divider, H1 minus H2S, so that is how much theoretically under the second law would be available if we had a perfect, completely lossless turbine, isentropic, so no entropy change, so basically reversible process. Now, we solve for H2 and we get H1 minus and also this is kind of easy to understand and easy to remember this form of the equation because basically what this says is now that the enthalpy at point two after the turbine is enthalpy at the inlet minus the fraction of theoretically available enthalpy change. And from that we take the fraction indicated by the efficiency. So perfect turbine, we get all of that. Real turbine, we would typically get something like 85 to 90% or thereabouts. And then when we want to calculate the thermal power to the turbine rotor, once we have obtained both enthalpy values, we multiply the enthalpy change with mass flow rate, and that's our thermal power. So this is a common equation we apply all the time for all kinds of components, always the power into a pump, for example, in the same idea, mass flow rate times enthalpy change over the pump. That's how much power the pump consumes in a turbine, how much power the turbine produces, mass flow rate times steam enthalpy change. Same thing if we have a heat exchanger, how much enthalpy of one flow changes times the mass flow rate of that flow. That's the heat rate of the heat exchanger, so on and so forth. But okay, we're at the turbine, so let's take a look at an example, because that is always the best way to figure out what all of these equations actually mean. So suppose we have a situation where we have an 8 megapascal main steam, 500 degrees Celsius temperature. We know that the steam expands to 5 kilopascal pressure in the turbine, and the isentropic expansion efficiency is 85%. So we would want to solve what is the end state of the expansion curve, that's first of all, and then we would want to solve turbine thermal power. We have to assume something for the mass flow rate for that to be possible to calculate. But first things first, so expansion curve and endpoint. So we know inlet state, and now from here in the HS diagram, we look for the point where 8 megapascal curve crosses 500 degrees Celsius curve. So 500 degrees Celsius is 773 
Kelvin, we add 273, and then we're somewhere right about here. And then we check where we cross the 8 megapascal line here. We find the crossing point. It's right over there. And then we move to the vertical axis. We check what number is it should be about 3,400 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's our H1. Then we need to figure out what is the H2. So that is the exit enthalpy from the turbine. Now we apply the isentropic expansion efficiency. We are looking for H2. We solve for H2, H1 minus efficiency times isentropic or ideal enthalpy change. How do we get that? So basically isentropic means constant entropy. It means that we don't really care about the value of entropy. We just care about not changing it from what it is at H1. So we come vertically straight down and we're expanding to five kilopascals. So here is the lowest thick line is one. Next one is 10, so somewhere roughly in between, straight down, and we should get about 2050 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so that is our H2S, and now we have all the variable values for this equation. We plug in the numbers, see what comes out. What comes out is 2250 kilojoules per kilogram. So, as simple as that, and now we know the state of the steam exiting the turbine. All right, that was kind of the most important thing that we were looking for here. But there's also one other thing that we usually are interested in, and that is the moisture level at the turbine exhaust. So now we look for where is 2250. It should be somewhere around here. There we find it. And these curves marked by X. So they are our steam quality. And we see that we are now somewhere between 85 and 90 in the X or steam quality. So that means that uh, maybe that's a little bit closer to 85. So say that it's around 87%. So that means that this 87% of the wet steam is still vapor phase. And 13% is already condensed into tiny little liquid droplets in the wet steam flow coming out of the turbines. So typically something like this, around 87% <coughs> would be the uh, minimum value that we, we can consider acceptable. So if we start to dive much deeper than 87% into the wet steam area, then the moisture is going to wear out our last turbine stages very, very quickly. So remember that basically in a turbine, the steam flow is going easily 400 meters per second. So even the tiniest of droplets are going to start causing erosion damage. So erosion happens, but we don't want it to be too fast so that it eats away our turbine too quickly. 87 is fine. And then the last point, we wanted to calculate the turbine thermal power now that we have the enthalpy change over the turbine. And how we do that, we have to, of course, assume some kind of mass flow rate. So let's say that we have a very small turbine, only 10 kilograms per second. Thermal power, mass flow rate times enthalpy change, plug in the numbers and we get 11.5 megawatts and turbine calculation is as simple as that.